rest of the community than perhaps has been in the case in the past. So in order to prevent any particular feeling of isolation or alienation among our artists, we've had two fairly important developments in recent times, uh, both of which I have been personally involved in. In the first case, we provided in legislation that any income derived from creative activity by an artist would be free of income tax. And then the next thing we did was we established a body uh, called the Astana, which is a very old word meaning a collection of poets and bards. And this by now is self-regulatory, uh, where artists can meet and discuss matters of mutual interest to themselves. And the important thing, I think, the practical importance of it is that any artist who is a member of that body is entitled to a fairly modest annual income. And that really relieves them of the pressure of earning their livelihood from their art and gives them much more freedom to indulge in their creativity and in their art. Now, both these things have been widely and warmly welcomed by the people of Ireland generally. And I think this demonstrates that among the modern Irish community there is an appreciation, first of all, of the importance of art in modern life uh, and secondly, of the position of the artist uh, in our community. In fact, a nation that doesn't express itself through its art and its artists is a contradiction in terms. It's like a person without any personality. Human history records many civilizations that have come and gone, disappeared, and the only thing they've left behind is their art. <laughs> Ireland has the youngest population in Europe. Half of them are under 25. This situation must be a source of great hope and encouragement for us, though in the short term, to provide the right sort of jobs for them all is a major challenge. Looking on this great jubilant scene of youthful vitality, good humor and enthusiasm, you realize that these young people are Ireland's truly greatest natural resource. And the man who's just smiling over at me now, I can see him smiling, and he is a man that we all love, and we're certainly... I've often heard him referred to as the boss, so there's no question about it. He's a very much the boss. So I'd like to welcome the man who is the leader of Fianna Fáil, Mr. Charles J. Holly over there. Let's hear it, folks! I am convinced that we must concentrate on modern technology and science-based industry, microelectronics, information technology, biotechnology. Our young people are adaptable, educated for and eager to be part of the modern world. They rightly see no contradiction between the enjoyment of traditional things and a keen interest in what is new and modern. Neither do I. My Ireland is one that places a value on all it has inherited from the past. 
and at the same time as a young country is eager to be part of the new technological age. Here in the Microelectronic Research Centre in University College Cork, Ireland prepares for the exciting future that is opening up for mankind. Ireland largely missed out on the first industrial revolution for mainly historical reasons and because of a lack of raw materials and access to capital. But the qualities demanded by the second industrial age, inventiveness, creativity and imagination, we have in plenty. Nor do these new industries involve the desecration of landscape or the misuse of natural resources. They are our hope for the future, and we must set about excelling in them. Well, that comes very awkward to me. Okay. In Ireland, we are a bit more conscious than most of how directly the well-being of mankind is linked to the land. A high proportion of the community here is engaged in farming. One of the challenges we face is to preserve the fragile miracle of our natural environment by using the great power of modern technology wisely and in harmony with nature while producing more food of better and purer quality. To explore the rich resources of the sea and harvest them in a managed, sustainable way, controlling pollution, protecting marine environments, and conserving fish stocks is one of my great ambitions. We must also play our part in the international efforts now being undertaken to safeguard the oceans of the world. My holidays are spent on an island off the coast of Kerry. It is called Inishvigalan, and it is one of the Blasket Islands, 10 miles out in the Atlantic Ocean. I translate very easily from life here in Dunquin and the Blasket Islands to life in Dublin. I don't, don't find any difficulty moving from one to the other. There's no overlap, as it were. And I think that's because they're both totally absorbing. Political life in Dublin, of course, is very demanding and takes up all your time and your attention. And then when you're down here, it's equally totally absorbing. You become absolutely immersed in the life of these islands and the community. So there's no question sort of of moving gradually from one to the other. You just move directly and immediately from one type of existence to a totally different uh, milieu. We bought the island from the last people to live here. They were the O'Dolly brothers, and they taught us about island life, how to judge the weather, to understand the moods of the sea and the tides and currents, about the puffins, the storm petrels, the black-backed seagull, the sea, where best to put down our lobster pots, and where to catch a fine big mackerel. According to folklore, Inishvika Law 